here. Okay, here we go. Oh, well, LePage. Le we're did streaming. You see the, uh, we do the, the announcement. Page. We are streaming. We're streaming. Oh, we're not doing. Oh. We're not doing the page debate. Oh, we're doing this. Why not? All right. This is the town hall. Well, because your guy didn't want it. Okay. Not everyone wants to have their voice on Discord. That's not the worst thing in the world. It's just. It's a little cringe because is, he's, he's going to have to have his voice on Discord for the house sessions. You know, so it's gonna happen anyways. No, he's not. Actually. Yes, he actually is. <laughs> so no. Yes, he one hundred percent for a fact is, or he can just not. No, a, no we, or, don't, we don't. Or, or he can just not attend happen. sessions, and no, not. You can do text. Okay, so then he can't, as well as I can, represent our district, and that's clear to the. Robert, people. please check your DMs. Quite frankly, I I'll think do. I'll, a, I'll, I'll do a little intro happen. thing for the fucking bullshit. So all right. Good fucking evening, America. This on Infowars.com is the town hall of congressional candidate for Acadia's third district, Mr. Admiral Robert Sanders. Uh, we were going to have a debate, but his opponent uh, has backed out saying that he doesn't want his voice to be on Discord. Very unfortunate. Uh, we thought we were going to have a lively debate here, but instead... Uh, we're we just going to have a little debate, town hall of uh, Mr. Admiral Robert Sanders. So, uh, if everyone could please applaud for, for the candidate, you know, while we introduce him. Woo! Oh my god. All right. Thank you, thank you for uh, very much for being here tonight, Mr. Sanders. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Mr. LePage. Thank you very much for having me. Of course, of course. Now, I've had my own history in TV uh, with uh, Paul LePage tonight. Great, very great uh, TV show. People should definitely watch it. But um, what we want to get to at the heart um, of this segment today uh, is what you believe as a candidate and what your vision is, not only just for Acadia, but for the United States as a whole. Uh, so my first question uh, is going to be, what would you bring differently to the House of Representatives rather than the status quo we have right now? Well, that's a very good and important question, Mr. LePage. That's exactly why I'm running for the office. I would, What I would bring differently to the House of Representatives is similar to what uh, your campaign is trying to bring to the United States Senate and what others in our movement are trying to bring to Congress and the American government at large. Uh, that being a new type of leadership. And those aren't just words. I'm talking about principled and morally centered leadership, which makes tough decisions and not popular ones, and which actually pushes for an active and willing Congress to do the hard things that we need to get done to save this country's workforce, to save the moral spirit of this country, and to readdress the foreign policy of this country, which has ruined and ravaged the world for so long. Uh, I'm running for the United States House of Representatives because when I served in the Navy, I watched firsthand a military industrial complex ravage and rape the world, uh, exploit the love that young men and women had for our country by uh, having them serve in uh, a military which does objectively evil things. Uh, and I watched our friends and family at home uh, lose their domestic soul, uh, work 40 years with no wages advancing, uh, and watch corporate socialism uh, where we and the Federal Reserve gives trillions and trillions of dollars to the ultra-wealthy. I'm running for the United States House of Representatives to bring that new style of leadership to ensure once and for all that we have an economy, a country, and a world which meets the principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you again for that question, Mr. LePage. Uh, and I'm very much so looking forward to bringing active and strong leadership to the House of Representatives that gets on calls just like this and demands change. Of course. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move on to my next question, which has to do with the current Chinese embargo. Uh, the United States has seen massive economic downturn ever since uh, uh, the Wilds administration has uh, implemented an embargo against China to prevent any further invasion of Ukraine. Do you think that this was appropriate given the economic turmoil that the United States is suffering itself? 
Oh, did someone just get off me? No, I don't think this is appropriate, Mr. LePage, at all. Uh, we have to be, we have to be making decisions uh, based on the health and security of here at home. Uh, and we, when we have an economy uh, that is like this, when we have a supply chain uh, that is completely broken, that hurts our ability to respond in a necessary matter to national security crisis which happened here at home. If a hurricane strikes uh, Louisiana right now, and we don't have the supplies to be able to address that hurricane, that leaves us vulnerable to the enemy. So, uh, you know, and this is about, and I know you agree with this, so what we have to do is not the establishment view of taking on China, uh, you know, in, in silly ways such as this, which only hurt our people here at home. What we have to do is be clear and strong towards China, uh, deal with them in uh, and I'm, I'm trying to be careful with my words here, deal with them in a very strong uh, and strict manner, uh, making sure and making it clear to the world who is at the top and who is, be, who is making the decisions. Uh, we, as the United States, have a moral obligation to lead the world. A moral obligation not to be the world's police, but to lead the world into global democracy. Not global governance, but global democracy, where nations can come together uh, and, and, and work out their differences through, through talking uh, through one another. To get to that... Do you think that the United States like deserves that responsibility? Like, we have to be the ones making sure everyone becomes a democracy? Uh, no, hold, hold, hold on. Let me, I, 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 clarif I clarified. I mean, I'm, again, this is not about global governance or global democracy. We, we can't uh, force anyone... To be a democracy but what we can do is have a situation where we talk to Iran where we as the United States talk to China and, and where uh, they talk to us um, that's what I'm talking about I'm not talking about changing the government of Iran or of China uh, that's an impossible and irresponsible task uh, but what we can do is work with those nations to try and affect some change on a global level to ensure uh, this supply chain is relieved. Uh, All right. Well, thank you very much for that answer, uh, Admiral. I'd like to pass off uh, the microphone uh, for a uh, for an audience question. Uh, so, Mr. Harry Biden is a uh, steel mill worker in Michigan. Uh, he lives with his wife Nancy and two kids, Chip and Roy. Uh, and he has an important question for. Well, I'd just like to say that I recently um, at, I am at risk of losing my jobs because American jobs are going overseas. And I've seen that happen to so many of my colleagues and co-workers and friends. So, Admiral, I'd like to ask you this. How will you protect American jobs like mine from going overseas to other countries? Well, thank you, Mr. Biden. And what do you do? What factory do you work at? I work at an, a car factory in Michigan. Well, you know, thank you for what you do for our country. I mean, you're truly the backbone of our nation. And let me tell you this. We've heard politicians for so long on both sides say, oh, we're going to protect your jobs, touting unemployment numbers while at the same time using their pen the power that they have as legislators or an executive to sign legislation to sign trade deals which sell out your job and give authorization to those corporations which you work for uh, which your community works for to move those jobs to lower wage countries and exploit those workers there exploitation on both sides uh, when we talk about bringing jobs back to this country, it's important to remember why they left. Uh, it was not some natural effect of globalization, uh, although it gets written off as that so often. This is the effect of corporate governance uh, on this world. And what we can do to take on that corporate governance, maybe not uh, exactly saving your job, but making sure that we have a system which will never ever make your job uh, worthless once again is to take on those corporations 
rewrite those trade deals and say once and for all that legislation will be made from the view of workers, not the corporations. Bringing you, Mr. Biden, to the table. Bringing Chip and Roy to the table and showing them that we have to do what is right to build their world. Uh, corporations are not people. You're a person. Uh, and when we have politicians, leaders, and executives who legislate because they are working class or because they do it through the lens of being working class, then we'll have that new world. I can promise you, Mr. Biden, as someone who uh, was homeless as a child, uh, as someone who uh, used to work paycheck to paycheck, um, this is personal to me. And I will be going to Congress to fight those corporations, to fight the domestic enemy that I will swore uh, that I swore and will swear an oath to once again, who represent a direct threat to this country and your safety and your family security. So we can reform those trade deals, rewrite them, take on those corporations, and address the core issue of American labor, which is you are not at the table. Well, thank you very much again, Admiral. Uh, my next question has to do with the Protecting Our Children Act. It is currently being tried in the uh, Supreme Court, um, and it might be uh, struck down. So if it is struck down, would you, as a member of the United States House of Representatives, pass a constitutionally uh, provisioned one uh, through the House? Well, I mean, that, that's one of the avenues that we could take, um, most definitely. Uh, I think what we have to really think about is, um, will, will that get done? And uh, as a congressperson, I can, I can assure you that I will be, uh, you know, going, stepping outside of the bounds and uh, going to those governors, uh, going to my governor, going to my senator, um, which you might end up being, uh, and saying, look, we need to get this done. I, you know, I'm not just going to be uh, voting for it in the House. You can assure. Uh, but, but you do support the provisions in the bill, like the general ones. 100 percent, and that's and I'm, and I'm saying we're going to get those done, even if the I mean, we're going to get those done. Uh, it's not just about voting for a constitutional amendment; it's about advocating for that constitutional amendment. And all I'm saying is, you can uh, rest assured that I will be an advocate for that amendment. Absolutely. Well, children takes me into my next question. Uh, as someone who, surprisingly, for someone in the military. Uh, tends to be more left wing on economics. Um, would you support? Would you support a uh, child tax credit uh, within whoa, 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 the whoa. United States uh, whoa, tax whoa, system? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't know where you got the idea that I'm left wing on economics. Uh, first of all, a, 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 a child tax credit seems like an interesting idea, uh, but I think we can address things in a different way. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We don't have to be uh, handing out money to people, uh, and we sure as hell don't have to be taxing them to the brim uh, to prop up uh, this bloated bureaucratic administrative system on so many things, whether it comes to health care or how we dole out infrastructure funding or construction projects, how we deal with housing in this country. These are all affected and bloated by bureaucratic systems so i don't think i'm very left-wing in, in, in when it comes to economics i actually think I, i'm quite traditionalist uh, i want to gut bureaucracy streamline the process and make sure that every single person in this country has the ability to meet the american dream to realize well, well, that, american that, mobility that, through, 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 to, to realize american mobility through uh working hard themselves you know i've done it that's a lot of good stuff especially uh for my base since we all know um, where I am, but on, on the issue of economics, uh, would you personally support a constitutional amendment requiring You cut off, Chase. Balanced budget constitutional amendment. No, I would not, and here's why. Uh, I would not support a constitutional amendment uh, to force a balanced budget because that restricts uh, the government's ability 
um, and in in uh, those situations where you would not want a balanced budget. I mean, say uh, a threat similar to the Nazis rose again. Uh, we have to be able, as a nation, um, to run deficits uh, in order to deal with the spending that we might not have at the time. Uh, that being said, I absolutely don't support uh, federal the, uh, the Federal Reserve spending that we have going on right now, um, again, where we have corporate socialism, where trillions and trillions of dollars, tens of trillions after this pandemic, are being shelled to uh, multinational corporations who have no allegiance uh, to any government whatsoever, but here at home are considered people. Um, what we have to do um, is really start thinking about uh, where we are doling out money. So, I, you know, to answer the frustration that those people calling for, a, uh, uh, you know, the advocates calling for a balanced budget amendment have, um, I, I'd have to say to that, focus on the Federal Reserve. Focus on those economic changes which would end uh, that kind of spending without oversight. When it comes to a balanced budget amendment, I, you know, I'd support legislation um, recommending a balanced budget and saying that, uh, you know, as much as possible, we like, making that the official goal of budgeting uh, within the Congress, something along those lines, mandating the Congress always have a balanced budget, again, restricts our ability to deal with um, unforeseen crises, not even just like war, but like the coronavirus situation where we would have to run a, defi a deficit for a year. Um, in the context of having a balanced or surplus budget uh, just to deal with the spending of the time. So I hear you, Mr. LePage, and the advocates of balanced budgets. I will fight hard for a balanced budget in the uh, House of Representatives, and if I am elected, and if I'm elected alongside other um, people who feel the same way, you can be assured that we will get a balanced budget in this next round of budgeting. Um, but I will not support a constitu constitutional amendment restricting uh, the Congress's ability to use its power of the purse. All right, moving on to our next question. Immigration is a hotly contested topic right now uh, in American politics and among the American public. Uh, Republicans right now are floating ideas such as a 10-year immigration moratorium, cutting down the number of H-1B visas and half and restricting general immigration and, ch and ending chain migration to the United States. Where do you stand on immigration policies? You know, I lean more right. Uh, we have a serious and s a terrible situation going on with immigration in this country. And let me just say, to the left-wing advocates, which would try and paint uh, anti-immigration people as anti-human or denying those of their humanity, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. What we're trying to do is protect the humanity of people here at home. Protect the humanity of my mother, my sister, my grandmother, who don't deserve to fear walking out in the street alone at night in, a, in one of our major American cities, who don't deserve uh, for those people living on the border who don't deserve uh, to look out of their back door to be sitting on their back porch and see coyotes running, running across their fields uh, with packs of guns, packs of drugs, in some instances children, uh, using those things to further a black market here in the United States. Uh, so, while I, I, I hear you on those specific policy prescriptions, Mr. LePage, we have to not, we have to make sure that these, uh, the reason the anger is there is not forgotten. Uh, these are warranted, uh, this is, this is warranted anger. Um, we have a flow of migration of, uh, people from unfortunately poor nations coming into our country. I think any reasonable and rational person who looks at a situation where we have tens of millions of people flowing into our country every so years, uh, that changes how this country operates. And we need to be 
uh, far more cognizant of that change um, and as legislators be able to deal with that. All right. Well, thank you very much again for uh, Admiral. We have another audience question, this time from Henrietta uh, Bedonio. Henrietta has a question over supply chain issues. Henrietta is 32 and she works as a teacher in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, in I Iowa with her husband, Frank Franklin. Your Admiral, question, Henrietta? Admiral, recently over the pandemic, we have seen that our supply chain issues have gotten worse. And because of the economic crisis that was caused by the embargo with China, supply chains were f further hammered. And it is really hard to get access to basic needs because of it. How would you fix the supply chain issue plaguing our nation? That's one of the most important questions asked tonight. And as we've touched on briefly in the China discussion, uh, it affects you directly. I mean, you're paying $11 for a pound of beef. You're paying um, $7 for... Uh, a pound of chicken. You're paying uh, $12 for a, 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 a dozen pack of soda. I mean, th this is really affecting people's uh, budgets. You're paying $70 to fill your tank. We really got to address this issue. And what we can do to do that is, again, the things I talked about in taking on China. Uh, but on top of that, um, what I mentioned to uh, the young man over here, uh, Mr. Harry Biden, who works... At one of our automobile companies here in the United States, in Michigan, take on this corporate governance, which has led a price rise in goods and services, not just for the pandemic, but for the past 40, 50 years, uh, and a Federal Reserve policy of quantitative easing uh, that shells out trillions and trillions of our dollars uh, from communities that you live in, communities that I live in, and gives it to those corporations which have no allegiance yet again uh, to the country or the community that they reside, uh, that their store resides in. Uh, dealing with those issues, taking on the corporate snake at the top of, of our country uh, who is choking our people of its soul uh, and its purpose. That's how we deal with the supply chain crisis. That's how we take on directly uh, those issues of price rises when it comes to your meat, your uh, gas, uh, heating your house, putting food on the table, paying those basic bills. Uh, and overall, you know, simply put, living uh, life as it should be lived. Uh, you should be afforded the ability to live life, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You're being denied that right now. Uh, that means we have a domestic enemy. And again, as the oath I've taken, uh, and the oath I will take as a, as a uh, member of the House of Representatives, if so honored to get that role, I will take on those domestic enemies and deal with the crises that we face which are being caused by those domestic enemies having put in place policies as they have. Mr. Sanders, um, your position on gun control has been quite unclear. Some members um, of the legislature currently want to ban AR-15 style weapons. Others want to rather uh, deduce gun restrictions uh, and purchase limitations in the United States. Where do you stand on gun control? Well, I, my position on gun control it shouldn't have been too unclear. I mean, I have a role, and I am an admiral in the United States Navy, let alone a person who lives in rural New Hampshire, a black person who lives in rural New Hampshire, <laughs> nonetheless. Um, I know firsthand uh, why people need weapons. Uh, and this is aside from why it's in the Constitution, which I'll get to in just a minute. Uh, people need to be able to defend themselves from crazies, because crazies exist. So I'll just say that. I'm in full opposition to, quote-unquote, 
gun control. Uh, and when it comes to why the founders put that in there, in the Constitution, the Second Amendment, and why it's in almost every, if not every, state constitution, is very clear. And we've lost that message. That message being tyrannical governments can rise quite easily, if not challenged. Authoritarian leadership can rise like that. The people need to be ready to stand up and challenge that tyrannical government to stand with our constitution to protect those principles and values which have built this oh-so-great nation. Now, I hear the left on the gun violence issue. You know, I, I, I cry for the children in Parkland, uh, for the people dancing in Orlando. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a tough issue. It's a very, very tough issue, personally, for me. Um, however, we cannot let reactionary emotion dictate policy and bring us down the wrong path. I, I want to deal with the gun violence issue. And we can, we can deal with the gun violence issue. Restricting people's Second Amendment right is not how we do it. Dealing with a mental health crisis in this country, a denial of people's basic humanity, is how we do it. Thinking about why a child in school would make the decision to go out, steal a parent's gun, and then bring it to school and do those horrible acts. Think, thinking about why that would be the case. Not dealing with the gun. Dealing with this deep systemic social issue that exists, which causes people to be so overtly violent in a way that we've never seen before. Uh, those are the issues that we have to deal with. I've been very clear on that my entire career. Um, and I feel for both sides, but we mustn't lose the principles that d built this nation uh, while at the same time remembering that we can do that and deal with the mental health crisis that we face in this country. Thank you for the question. All right. Um, do we have any other audience questions? I have one. Another All right, Henrietta, you're back up. On top of the supply chain issue, there is also the big in issue of infrastructure. A lot of our highways are in states of disrepair. Our bridges, same thing. There is a lot of the country's roads, bridges, and highways that need that are in dire repair. Um, and on top of that, just to add, a third of the country does not have access to basic Wi-Fi. And in our digital society, Wi-Fi has become uh, quite a bit very important, which also ties into the um, issue of infrastructure. So, Admiral, I ask you this. How will you improve the country's infrastructure? Sorry, one second. I'll be right there. It's a very important question. I'm trying it's nicotine easy. gum for the first time. It's an interesting experience. That is an interesting experience, but this is a far oh. more important question than okay. the use of drugs. So, Mr. Biden, or, I mean, yeah, Mr. Biden, that's a very important question. Uh, and one of the issues that caused me to run for this position in the first place. We do face a serious infrastructure crisis that doesn't just have to do with our infrastructure, but again has to do with so many issues it bleeds down to so many issues it, do, it has to do with our national security our ability to move equipment across uh, this vast nation it has to do with our um, commerce our ability to um, effectively do commerce uh, it, ha it, it affects so many issues um, unfortunately the legislation that we see in this in the I believe it's in the house at the moment 
Um, I've been blanking on the name, but it's an infrastructure package, uh, which I read through it. It, it, it contains provisions which spend um, $200 billion on roads alone. <laughs> okay, uh, that's wasteful spending. Uh, that's the federal government doling out dollars and deciding where it goes, superseding uh, the state governments. The solution to the infrastructure crisis, which I feel needs to be taken, is one that's fiscally responsible, is one uh, that deals with the issue of being able to dole out those funding, those funds where they need to go, while also understanding that the federal government is the mechanism for a lot of states, uh, New Hampshire and uh, many in New England here in my district included, uh, it's the only way that those states will be able, and those states and those regions will be able to get uh, those funds. The program I support is a grant program uh, which allows all of those projects uh, to be, you know, a municipality will come to uh, the appropriate federal agency, they'll apply for the grant, and then the grant will be given to them uh, as needed. That means that we won't be uh, putting a, a number on the bill just to put a number on the bill. Oh, we spent $500 billion on infrastructure. That means infrastructure is done. No, the communities that need it will come to the federal government after uh, deliberating in their own community and deliberating in their own legislatures and then say, we need these funds where? We need these funds for our pipes. We need these funds for our highways. We need these funds for our bridges. Creating programs which have those funds to be able to do that and being able to dole out uh, through each fiscal year um, funds, uh, budgeting for those funds, retroactive budgeting for what was spent uh, in those grant programs. I think you'll, and being able to deal with a lot of the zoning issues that we face uh, through an omnibus legislation such as that. Uh, that's an infrastructure project which would be bipartisan and which would get things done effectively and quickly. And once I'm in the House of Representatives, you can be assured, Mr. Biden, uh, that I will be pushing that infrastructure legislation, that I'll be making sure that no funds are spent wastefully, um, and that we will be dealing with the crisis uh, that so importantly affects our national security. Thank you for the question. All right. Well, that was all the questions I have. So I guess this was a great town hall. Thank you so much, Admiral, for being here. We wish, we wish you luck in your race, um, especially since your opponent didn't give us the time of day to come uh, come debate. So thank you very much for being here and taking audience questions from Harry and uh, Very nice people. Um, so thank you very much for everyone tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday night. Thank you. Dude.